Hey there everybody, thanks for joining me for another one man review. Today I'll be taking a look at a really special book. This is the Absolute Swamp Thing collect collecting the Lynn Wayne and Bernie Wrightson run, the original Swamp Thing run. So obviously, like with all the Absolutes, it comes in this, this nice box here. Um, and then one thing I really like about this is the cover's printed on like a felt or something, so it's kind of fuzzy and feels like moss. Normally, I'm not running out to grab these absolutes, especially the run of the Alan Moore stuff. I've seen images of it being recolored with very like modern coloring on it, and that was kind of a turnoff to me. I really like the old flat coloring of those books, the Sandman books and stuff like that. I've seen a lot of recoloring. The reason I got this one is because one of my favorite colorists of all time, Jose Villarubia, did the recolor job. And I've been following Jose's work since he was on Hellshock. Jay Lee's Hellshock was when I first saw his work. But late, lately on Instagram, Jose has been posting a series, and I guess on Facebook as well, called From a Colorist's Perspective. And he's talking about color restoration in comics and what his preferences for uh, recoloring books are and making the same complaints about the issues I have with like some of the omnibuses that I've picked up like the Moon Knight one I grabbed that just had these like really really overly saturated colors and me and Sean had talked about for a while like how how would you go about recoloring one of these books to capture the look of the desaturated colors that get uh, that you get when things are printed on newsprint and soaked up and have the gray of the newsprint uh, and yellow over time and all of that. And Jose was posting, you know, from a color expert standpoint, how he would go about doing these things. And I thought, man, he's doing exactly what I want out of color restoration, which is uh, get the get the like line work nice and and black, so it's you don't have like blue over trapping, you know. And then instead of trying to recreate the dot pattern look of the colors, just get the colors in there nice and solid as they would be if the print technology had been better. So basically you're keeping all of the aesthetic features of the art. And then hopefully if you have access to the original art, which they obviously did for a lot of these pages, um, you can actually get a better representation of the artist's line work than before. And then the colors actually printed where you can't see the dots. I know a lot of people are nostalgic for the dots, but I really like to see it like at a uh, peak aesthetic quality. And those people were coloring with uh, the desaturation in mind. So to me, seeing it restored to its full intensity of color actually isn't peak aesthetic of that era. Um, and I think, you know, what people did with flat colors at that time was really innovative. So updating it is also kind of betraying the ability that those colorists had to make really compelling compositions with a limited color palette. And I think the aesthetics of that, if done right, is really beautiful. So I was very, very happy to see Jose was doing exactly what I would want if I could be in charge of a restoration project like this. And so I had to get it. Um, my only complaint about the book is that it's printed on a glossy paper, but let me give you a spoiler here. Uh, we actually got an interview with Mr. Villarubia, which will be dropping tomorrow, the day after I post this. And he was saying that if he had the preference, he would have printed it on an uncoated paper. So his aesthetic is exactly what I want out of like reprinted omnibus is that when you're doing these, you recolor it the way that Jose's done it in here. And then you print it on a matte, a thick matte paper that kind of has the gray coloring of a newsprint. So because they couldn't do that, um, Jose went and scanned a bunch of newsprint and put that in there digitally to kind of recreate the grayness of the print. And I think that's a, a really good idea um, in terms of making it look as close to the original experience as possible and the original intentions and constraints that were put on the object. I think part of the problem with restoration now is they're trying to imagine, okay, we're taking away all of the constraints rather than just like, hey, we could have done this with a finer dot pattern or something like that. Uh, so leaving the constraints on the artists in terms of how they choose to construct the art, but taking away the production constraints, I, I think is the, the ethic or the aesthetic there. And I really like that. 
Also, uh, I've never read any of this. I've read Alan Moore stuff, but I've never read the original stuff. Probably because when I've seen reprints, it didn't look that good to me. But when you see it in this version, you can really see Bernie Wrightson's work on full display. So this is interesting to me also from, like, I've never read this, this before and I got to read it. Like, I had no idea that there was an original appearance of Swamp Thing where the character's name was uh, Olsen. Alex Olsen was the name. Yeah, rather than Alex Holland, so I would never never knew that. Uh, it's cool that they have that collected in here. And then to get a sense of what the series was, and just, you know, to have some of Bernie Wrightson's really amazing art, like, re reprinted as well as it could be, because, like I said, it looks like from the back of the book, they have quite a few scans of the original art. So Jose was able to o work over top of um, prime line art instead of just having to work from print sheets or things like that and you get to see some of the really really amazing things that the colorists were doing I mean it could go on all day about Wrightson's art but since I'm, I'm really got this because of the recoloring uh, you can see some of the mixing of colors that they did here like putting a lot of small little blobs of color next to each other to get certain effects even though there there's no effects there it's just flat colors next to each other there's some really beautiful images in here like this and those strange color combinations add to the aesthetics it's not a nostalgic thing for me it's just that there's an eeriness to that limited palette that i think worked really really well for the colorists who learned how to use it and when these projects are recolored getting rid of that eeriness um, i think it does some damage to the actual like content of the book which is horror comics and same with some of the sandman recolors i've seen they take away the eeriness and replace it and the, the Brian Bolin one that Brian Bolin did over the Batman the Killing Joke, it took away the strange surreality of it and brought it back to more naturalistic colors. And I think that's actually to a deficit of the art. So this is really nice to preserve some of that kind of gross color combinations like you get here that make things feel oozy and gross and swampy. Um, and then for me, it was a real pleasure just to see a whole bunch of rights in work. Like, I know Bernie Wrightson. I love his work. I've seen plenty of it, but I don't think I've ever owned a book with his work in it and read stuff with him and seen him as a storyteller just because it was stuff that came out, you know, before I was buying comics. And then it's been poorly re reproduced and reprinted. So to see it like this is amazing. And to see his powers as a composer and a storyteller with pages like this is really, really satisfying. It's also like, it's hard looking at someone as influential as Bernie Wrightson to not go through it and kind of track influences forwards and backwards. Like looking at pictures like this, it's really, really hard not to think, oh, there's Sam Keith, right? Like proto Sam Keith in the making. Um, obviously, Kelly Jones, Sam Keith, uh, Troy Nixie is a more new wave guy. There's a lot of people I'm aware of, uh, you know, where it's like, oh, the influence from Wrightson is completely obvious. And that's nothing new, but it's fun to see it. And then I was also kind of trying to track like backwards, um, you know, who would some of his influence have been? And obviously Frank Frazetta is one of them. I think Will Eisner is a big one. There's some Milk Kniff in there. And there's probably some of the eerie EC artists like Graham Ingalls and stuff that I haven't spent too much time with. So there's probably some of that in there. But it's it's cool to track those schools or those lineages. I, I really like that. And it is cool to see like how much Bernie Wrightson can make me unsettled with something just like this few little hairs on this guy's palm because he's a werewolf but you get like this gross hairy palm thing i will say bernie wrightson really struggles to draw dogs this dog <laughs> looks like a person's face with the big mustache throughout the book so he's not very good at dogs but he does a badass werewolf and uh this is one of those ones where you can really see once you've got that original scan of the art and the, the black and white line work can really be preserved the way it should be and then the right colors put on top of it. It's just stunning imagery and you're like, oh yeah, like no wonder this guy was so influential. I can only imagine, you know, kids picking up these comics when this came out or having their mind blown by this. There's also some really cool formal things that I noticed on here, like this two panel shot where you have the chandelier stitching them together as one space, but there's a break in the action to go and focus in on what's going on, and then you let the character come back. Uh, this this wouldn't work without that break, because you have this character coming from here to here, so the, 
the idea to zoom in on the on the characters here and then go back to that but still leave these stitched as one space is just really masterful storytelling really cool comics formalism and you're highlighting the fact that uh, the chandelier is an important thing so it's not just play it, it's it highlighting an important aspect of the story there's some more cool like will eisner influence here i think with working the title of the story into the clock here and then all of these notes like getting the credits in there this is a sketch the artist's conception of the sketch from bernie wrightson but also it functions within the story as these characters doing research into this monster and uh, so these are like news report stuff i've seen a ton of things like this in comics before but this seems like an earlier instance of it and again when i'm looking for those influences it seems very eisner-esque so I think there's a lot of Eisner in, in rights and uh, I, the, the big two seem to be Eisner and Frazetta, like Frazetta's line work with kind of Eisner's rubberiness. It's an interesting combo. There is this story here, which is about a, a town made by a, a guy who builds robots. He's a clock worker who builds robots. And that kind of seemed to me like resonant with Alan Moore's town where there's like a town that's flooded uh, and there's a bunch of vampires in it or just the idea that the swamp thing's kind of traveling around to these different weird towns the sense of like uh, americana almost i even though this one actually i don't know that this one's set in america he goes to europe for a while but there's also just a really funny thing where the aesthetic throughout is very much like this these old kind of horror settings where you, you get a sense that the the villages and so you know it's villages that are 100 plus years old and then at the same time you're in a modern world where you know people are referencing things in a modern sense and it's kind of disjointed in that way it feels disjointed to me because it feels more like it should be happening in the late 1800s uh here's just some really awesome imagery here things that i've never seen before i i've never you know i <laughs> obviously have some holes in my comics history pre pre 90s that I need to fill in more of because this is really awesome work this is where I think of uh, what Troy Nixie is doing now how he's kind of bearing the torch on that but just some of these awesome images of this and I, I quite like when it goes into the Lovecraftian more cosmic horror I think that's more scary to me than the down-to-earth like monster or weak stuff uh, so I really like this story and just the designs in there. I also noticed throughout, I was able to tell, like, some some pages like this one have really crisp, sharp black and white art. And some pages, ha and those ones I look at, and I, you know, I, I've always heard about how tiny, teeny tiny Bernie writes and lines are. And there's nothing in here where I went, oh, wow, that guy's doing so much detail, so much teeny lines. Like, they're nice, long, sexy lines, but not ridiculously thin like I've heard about but then there's some pages like this one and I know it's not going to show up on the camera but there's a little bit of softness to how the line art looks which looks like um, the original art hasn't quite been adjusted to pure black and white it looks like it's still in a grayscale that's been stripped of its color and then you get to a sense of how thin the tapers on his lines actually go and I think in some of the more adjusted ones you probably lose the very sharpest tip and so it's interesting to see images like this where you're like okay okay I can see a little bit closer to what it looked like in the original and it just made me wonder about what the mix of sources were in this um, I know that they were working from original art where they could and then kind of the best like Oh, is it reproduced here? Is it reproduced there? The best reproduction they could find. And it's just it just goes to show like why we should all be preserving, now that we can, pre preserving high-res scans of our art. Uh, because if, you know, 100 years from now someone ever wants to see our stuff, we have, uh, we'll have access to the, the best, best reproductions. There's also um, some real fun instances as the series goes on where I think I can spot writes in like it's saying that he's doing the plot and art here but the art starts to look different and this is like the last issue he does before uh someone else steps in and takes over and so he's obviously kind of losing his steam for it at this point or falling behind or something and, and is rushed 
and the art looked different to me and it really really struck me in certain panels this being one of them there are a couple other instances like this one uh, throughout this last story here where it really really looks to me like he brought other people into ink it and my best guess given some of the panels like this one here the way the line work looks and knowing that he shared a studio and was friends with Mike Kaluta, this looks like they brought in Mike Kaluta to do a lot of the inking. This one here also very much has that feel to it. Um, so it's interesting to see like Wrightson's pencils with what's obviously someone else's ink. And it's really interesting when you see someone that's got a very particular unique style and you're like, oh yeah, that looks like Mike Kaluta. And then honestly, like I was pretty sure they were associated, but I'm not such a huge historian, but in the end of the book, I'll show you they actually talk about what good friends they were and how involved Mike Kaluta was. So that kind of confirmed my visual suspicion there, I think. I, someone else would know better, I'm sure. But I, I'd be curious if it's well known that Mike Kaluta did some of the inking on this issue or even penciling. And then they want to collect this up to the point where Alan Moore takes over, I believe. So they have a couple other issues in here that are drawn by Nestor Redondo. And I've never heard that name before, but this guy is a really, really impressive artist and does a very good job of mimicking rights and style. The anatomy of the figures isn't so exaggerated. He's a little bit more grounded, a little bit more Alex Raymond, Mac Raboy type of illustrator, but he can get that kind of finish that writes and gets and does a hell of a job with the monsters as well. And actually with his texture work on the monsters, I feel sets up like Bazette coming in a little bit more like this type of stuff over here uh, doesn't look like something like that I've seen in the rest of the rights and work in this book, but it does look like something that I'm familiar with from from Moore and Bazette's and uh, Totlebin's run. But here you can see that real uh, Flash Gordon, Alex Raymond kind of influence in the art, just even in the costuming you know, of this character, the fact that they're dealing with spaceships and stuff, some of the poses and things like that. Uh, so that, that was really interesting to me as well. And then in the back of the book, you've got all kinds of cool extras here, including this interview with uh, Alan Weiss, who Alex Ross told us uh, was, is someone that, who was a big supporter of Strange Death of Alex Raymond. So <laughs> that much, much thanks, Alan Weiss. really appreciate that. But also seeing that Michael Kaluta, Louis Simonson, and Alan Weiss were the models for the very first Swamp Thing story, that short story when he was Alex Olsen. And then they even have some of the photographs that they took with Bernie Wrightson over at his apartment as reference photos for that first story. So that shows like how uh, involved Kaluta was to me and what good friends they were. And it kind of confirms my suspicion, I think, that he did some inking in that final issue that they were sharing a studio together. I think they were all part of the studio, right? With um, Jeffrey Catherine Jones, like this says copyright Jeffrey Catherine Jones there. And I must, I think Barry Windsor Smith, they were, they were all a crew, right? Is that correct? So it looks like some of them worked on it, but really, really fun to see these photographs here that they've preserved those materials is awesome. And then probably, of course, my favorite part is the book of the, is they've got a pretty good chunk of almost like an artist edition here where you can see the original art and you can see like I was talking about the pages where they had the original art there's a little bit more softness to it the scans have the, they haven't been fully sharpened yet um, so I think that's why I was able to identify some of those pages as having original art behind them but also there were a lot of pages in here that they did have original art for that didn't have that slight blur of just working from one of these so it's it's really nice that they had access to this much. I don't know if this is all they had access to, but they had access to a significant amount of the original artwork, obviously, and that helped the restoration look as good as it could. And just, it's really, really fun to look at all this. And also, I don't know how he worked. There's not an explanation of that in there. If this was just his layouts and this is his inks, or if this was just how he penciled and then he went straight to ink from there but you can see in certain instances, at least his thumbnails and roughs, maybe his pencils. Uh, again, I don't know if he was working on vellum or what, it doesn't look like it. It's, it looks like on yellowed board. So I'm uh, curious if people know anything about Wrightson's process and how these fit in, but it's a really cool extra feature in the book. Uh, and then 
At the very end here, they have a couple pages of thumbnails, pencils for a Swamp Thing story that they were going to come back to Lin Wein and Bernie Wrightson in the 80s. It was going to be a three-issue miniseries, and then Bernie Wrightson decided that he didn't want to retread old ground, so didn't go back. But it, it looks like this is uh, his layouts here and then a tighter pencil there. So I'm assuming this is the layouts, this is the pencils, and then from there he just goes straight to ink. I'm not sure how that, if that's how he does it, but uh, that's, that's pretty impressive if he's adding all that detail and texture and lighting straight to ink from there. So I, I've always appreciated Wrightson's art. I uh, always liked anything I've seen of it, but really, 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 once you get... Uh, a book like this and get to read through it. it it obviously makes a bigger impression on me it makes me want to go back to doing the brush work that i was doing on strange death of alex raymond and uh yeah it gave, gave me a whole new appreciation for one of the the true masters and one of the true like people who like trendsetters that set a, a whole generation of stylists basically uh who i all i like all of all of them everyone who came out of this kelly jones all, all those people i named uh Sam Keith, etc. So really, really happy to have this. And then this is, like I said, this is what I want. I would buy so many reprints if this is how they were handled. Um, I think Jose Villarubia has set the standard for what a recolor and a remaster should look like. The respect that should be given to the original colorists and the original art as much as possible. And then even his idea to have it printed on non-coated paper um, he told us that there was just a, a shortage of that paper and they didn't want to wait for that paper to come back in, so they, they went with this instead. But that is my ideal right there. Like the way this looks, solid blacks, ink work perfect, none of the weird trapping things with the blue overlapping it, um, colors restored without the dot tones, and then, yeah, if possible, published on like a heavy, heavy, not coated, heavy matte stock kind of grayish paper. I think that we would really be treating comics as the art objects that they are, and especially legendary runs like this, I think deserve, and we as readers deserve these kind of artist library, I don't want to say artist editions, but deluxe library editions of these very important works presented at the, in their original form, but with the production capabilities of today would be great. So thank you so much, Jose, for setting the standard on that. And I hope a, peop uh, I hope a lot of people, A, are hiring Jose to do more of this. He gave us a, a list of names he would like to, to do this treatment on. And uh, the more noise gets behind those names, like a Neil Adams book and things like that would be awesome. And then just hopefully sets the standard, you know, hopefully the companies pay attention and realize that that uh, we demand better of them and that if I'm going to be paying 80 some odd dollars for a book it, it better really have the effort put into it like Jose put into it so it's a stellar job all around it's it's a really cool book the stories you know I didn't mean, we're talking about the stories I'm sure everyone kind of knows Swamp Thing they're they're good 1980 stories I feel like it's pretty emo <laughs> you know it's this kid running around um, stuck inside of his own head not able to communicate with everyone just kind of bummed out fighting monsters so I could see that uh, appealing to a generation of like stressed out uh, emo kids. And I, I think that could uh, speak to a lot of people now who have been through a couple of years of more isolation with COVID and whatnot. So the stories feel pretty relevant still. It's just, you know, I don't read any of the captions or anything like that. So that's that old comic style of writing where they're thinking like, hey, I better kick this guy in the face, you know, okay, now I'm going to kick him. And then the caption saying that. I don't find that type of scripting to be good, but I thought the, the plots were good. So really, really enjoyable product all the way around. And definitely check back in tomorrow for our interview with Mr. Jose Villarubia talking about this book, talking about his restoration of Richard Corbin's Den and just his history and comics, his philosophy on coloring, all kinds of cool stuff. He, he's an, an amazing guy to talk to. We had a, a really fun time. And it's a great interview. So I hope you all excited about that. I hope you all can get yourself a copy of his his recoloring of Rights and, and Swamp Thing in the Absolute Edition. It's a beautiful book. Support well-made reproductions. If you enjoy what we're doing on the channel here and want to support us, there's two ways to do that. The first one is through our Patreon. We have two different tiers of interaction on there. The first one at the lower tier, you just get early access to our videos 
and those are usually a month or so ahead of, ahead of time that we put those on there. And then uh, in the second tier, you can get exclusive access to early previews of the books that Sean and I are working on, our personal comics projects, as well as uh, take part in the Prane Day web experiment, which is an interactive Groundhog Day story where you can vote on what happens to the character next, and that allows us to track evolutions in the AI image making technology that we play with. Uh, any of the money we get from that just goes back into helping us afford to buy the books that we look at and review. So we try and put that right back into other creators' pockets. And that just keeps a good flow of, of books for us to expose you to. And then if you want to support Living the Lion itself, the best thing to do is to support Living the Lion Publishing. So we'll go ahead and take a look at one of the books that Sean is putting out now. Whole new world. Whole new world. Thanks for following along. Take it away, Jack. You want to see all these books? Smash that subscribe button and the like button and the bell, and then you get them.